Thank you very much, David. That was uh, fascinating. I hope everyone got a few uh, tips and uh, tricks from that. I like the idea of taking an angle grinder to the uh, street curb. Anyone from the council here? Um, okay, so we've got uh, plenty of time for questions, so I'll throw it open if anyone's got any questions they want to um, want to ask. We have a roving mic. Yeah, do we have a roving mic? Yep. <coughs> Okay, so just um, put your hand up and... And I'm happy to answer questions about the technical nitty-gritty of Aussie Street or Retro Suburbia or the big issues or um, uh, even further aspects of the story. <laughs> Um, yeah, hi David. Um, I've got a question about the format, you know, why you chose this particular way of presenting um, the information. Mm. I can see how you're tackling a lot of behavioural um, attitudes and things as well as, you know, sort of basic technical tips. But did you start off in your speaking career like this or is this an evolution? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, um, there's a couple of things about, about this, I suppose. I've always done some public presenting work since the early days of permaculture, which of course uh, when I was in my early 20s, uh, but most of that was very serious, very technically focused, and I also used to think it was sort of slightly um, uh, false to do the same presentation ever twice. Uh, whereas I started with Aussie Street about uh, more than a decade ago, uh, as a way of illustrating these ser really serious issues. Uh, but there weren't names for any of the people. And then after I'd been doing it for a while, I put names to it and it sort of started to come alive. <laughs> and then I also, I suppose, just realised the understandings about storytelling as a powerful way to communicate things and uh, of been using this and uh, evolving it for some time. And then it was a completely oral thing, even though there was clunky PowerPoint graphics in it originally. Uh, it, the story was completely just in my head, really. And then as a chapter in the book, we decided to include it as a short story. And I wrote it down, and there's actually a lot more detailed, juicy bits and pieces in that story in the book than we could fit into the presentation. But it was like writing that was also a new experience because it like wrote itself. Oh, what about this and that and, you know, and these people are connected to... So it sort of like did have a, a life of its own. And then since the release of the book, we had now have these, uh, you know, the beautiful graphics by Brenna Quinlan who, who uh, did the illustrations in, in the book. And yeah, I think it's um, yeah a very different evolution. But maybe it's also the passing of uh, my co-originator of permaculture, Bill Mollison. Of course, he was a great storyteller, and the power of using story to communicate things is important. I think a lot of this is based on home ownership and it's increasing that we're renting yeah um, and that makes it really hard to do any of this so have you got any theories about well, how that can be addressed of course the process megan moved in um without actually being an owner and in a way without being a tenant but actually through a process actually became the owner but then uh as owner set the place up as a sort of a communal space. The people at 4A and 4B, of course, are tenants and it illustrates some of the classic sort of conundrums and, and difficulties of uh, ownership and the separation from the owner. Who is the owner? You don't even know who it is and that it's, that's mediated by a real estate agent who keeps those parties apart, mostly. Um, uh, but of course, the squatters also illustrate that this notion that we own something is an incredibly superficial construct. 
you know, and the, the connection to um, uh, Aboriginal uh, linkage was very deliberate. So there's a whole lot of um, aspects to that. And certainly a lot of the examples we have on the website are ones where people own, but several of them are um, rentals. And we talk in the book about a lot of the strategies for how we can work in that way. And what I say to young people is don't buy property. Don't buy property. The owner is taking the risk that that property is actually going to crash in value because we are at the end of this enormous long property bubble. When did that property bubble start? Based on the data, the separation of real estate prices from GDP, if we accept GDP for the sake of the argument, is a real measure of economic uh, value, which is a dubious thing in itself. But the separation between those begins in about 1982. So the rise in property values from the end of the last collapse, which was 1948, from 1929 to 1948, house prices in Australia fell, bottomed out in 48. The rise from 48 to 82 pretty much parallels rising GDP. So you could say that's fair, that's real. After that, it just unhinges, and then it super accelerates uh, in uh, two stages of acceleration, one in the 90s, and then again in the 2000s, and then a third one really after the, the GFC. So this world we're living in is coming to an end faster from the collapse of virtual things like money than it is from the rapidly accelerating climate change or the rapidly depleting resources that still sustain us almost 100% for transport, for example, in oil. So those larger forces of peak oil climate change are the big underlying drivers, but the symptoms that people will experience are more likely to be things like property bubble collapse and or geopolitical crisis instability that throws us into, oh shit, there's a, some minor war between China and the US and where the meat and the sandwich. Um, so we don't, those geopolitical things are inherently unpredictable. There's huge number of risks building, but the property bubble one is a no brainer. Uh, and I believe that we're actually already through that uh, point. But what that means is that people who are renters are letting the owners take the, the risk. So this is a transformation away from us, you know, poor renters, you know, no assets, having to pay these ridiculous rents and this wealth increase that just underpins everything of owning a place, doing nothing, and it's not, of course, the house that's rising in value. Houses are often declining in value. It's the land base. It's just going up. But yeah, there's a lot of positive strategies of, of how to get a connection directly to a landowner. One of the most important things, of course, is this taking a border strategy. So there's a direct, you know, familial relationship between the person who owns and the person who rents. But a lot of us find that very touchy territory. And I believe it's not just the privacy thing, it's because in middle-class Australia, we all believe we're equal, aren't we, in this country? So to be sharing your house with someone where you still have the power to say, look, sorry, at the end of your tenancy, I don't think this is working, I'd like you to leave, would be having to come to terms with the fact that we have more power than this other person who we know very well. That's a reality. These are realities we need to deal with, and I think more bad things come from us not facing power differentials than from sort of acting like we're all equal in this world. 
Sorry that that's a sort of huge answer to uh, a very simple and obvious question. <laughs> Um, I'd just like to ask your comments in regards to developers in recent years decreasing the size of, you know, down from the quarter acre block to 500 metre square blocks where, you know, more people and less ability to do any gardening and stuff. Yeah, it's actually been incredibly a failure in actually getting more people per hectare or per square kilometre. What's happened in the modern subdivisions really starting in the 1990s, and this is well analysed by uh, an academic in Canberra, um, uh, uh, Hall, who showed how the, there's still a lot of public open space in these modern subdivisions, and there's big frontages, the sort of American style, you know, that make the street feel really spacious, and then you have a very large house shunted into the back of the block with often huge garage space. And he showed how this is being driven by basically the building industry, the banks, and the real estate industry. It's not actually really being driven by this is what people want. People are told that they can get maximum value for dollar in terms of the amount of square footage of house and garage in a single large and often until recently, single story covering most of the lot. People are then on the mortgage treadmill, of course, paying for that mostly away from home. And then the low amenity of those living environments is sort of partly compensated by the dream that we're only here temporarily. We're going to be somewhere better at some stage in the future. Now, those, that template of suburbia, yes, is quite different to, to what I illustrated with Aussie Street. And it's a tragedy that a lot of the retro su suburbia action has to happen in the, that pattern. But there are quite a few positives in that. And we, although they're not a strong focus in the book, we do point out some of them. Like one of the really fantastic positives is the big double triple garage out the front is perfect for a home manufacturing business. And you roll up the roller doors and put your wares and maybe even build projects out on the forecourt and then you sort of close it up. And in fact, a lot of those big garages can be easily retrofitted for more people to live in. Those houses actually have, the houses are bigger but our households are smaller. But the key metric that's not being ever discussed in the um, in the planning discourse about urban sustainability is hours of occupancy. And I've basically been banging on about this for over a decade, challenging academics to say, get real, start measuring what the hell is going on in our urban fabrics, rather than this constant sort of same old thing going around. We either cover the agricultural land out on the fringes or we create New York in the centre. Or, as Infrastructure Australia said for Melbourne, maybe we can create London by putting, you know, four-storey apartment blocks right through all the middle belt of suburbs. So there's very strong pressures wanting to fill in what they call the missing middle in our big capital cities. That is a tragedy for the world we're facing. We don't actually need to build any more buildings. We have enough buildings. We have 8 million empty beds in, uh, in Australia. That was data from nearly 10 years ago. There's 30,000 apartments in Melbourne that are kept empty, brand new apartments, just as mint condition gambling tokens to flip back onto the development market. And then there's huge opportunities to retrofit existing buildings in what we call the discretionary economy, which will basically collapse uh, with the property bubble collapse. So the dog shampoo services, the gymnasia, you know, half of at least of the coffee shops, you know, we actually don't need all this stuff. And so what historical downturns show is that those businesses will uh, disappear what are we going to do with all these buildings? What we're going to do is retrofit them for people to live in. So we don't need to build anything more. 
But, of course, while the machine keeps going on, um, places like Melbourne, the retro suburban potential is being destroyed as we speak, and the great potential of country towns like Morwell is that there still is the space to do this modification um, of houses, have solar access to gardens, to solar panels, to passive solar design. Um, and so in some ways that sweet point of opportunity is in some of the uh, regional uh, uh, towns. But as I said, there are ways of creatively uh, looking at those modern suburbs. And the last thing I'd say about that is what I said at the start of that answer is there's huge amounts of public space. And a lot of that public space is not heritage gardens like Fitzroy Garden or something. It's just a bit of mown grass with a few relatively young plantings of some native trees and shrubs. So that means those suburbs have huge potential for what I call urban agriculture, like commercial urban agriculture, you know, and whether that's community gardens or whether it's actual commercial stuff, even if the home house economy is not so great for growing, you know, the family fruit and, and, and veggies. So there is still a lot of space in those uh, landscapes. We just have to think differently about them and that will require more social acceptance of doing things differently than we currently have. Whereas at the moment, people on the freehold lot, to an extent, can do whatever they like. They don't need to wait for permission. I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are on um, the practicalities and implementation and, and use of local currency systems, like, you know, say within the, the Gippsland area. Yeah, local currencies, I think, have a, a big potential. We know in the collapse, economic collapse in Argentina in 2000, um, local currencies proliferated enormously. And there was a lot of sort of crap and bad shit that did happen with some of them. Uh, but that was mostly the ones set up in a hurry, that the ones that had been set up before the crisis uh, seemed to work the best. And then when... Um, the Argentinian economy recovered with high energy prices for gas and agricultural products and whatever, you know, most people went mostly back to, you know, monetary uh, peso exchange. I don't know what's happened there since, since the second collapse of, of the peso, but I think um, the most important thing that we're trying to stimulate is to recognise that we've never had in history, certainly in Australia, such a fragile household and community non-monetary economy, where you're not even using a currency, you're just like swapping eggs for lemons with someone, or what you do within the household, whether you call that a family or whatever, that there's not a, a, an accounting of you've done this, I've done that. It's just all in the mix. And whatever sort of extra economy we have, and of course there's lots of things we can't do at that level, historically we've always had in the past some sort of household and community non-monetary economy. And that's mostly just reciprocity within a, a family or people who live together. So I think that's the most important level to rebuild, and it, rebuild, it does rebuild spontaneously Anyway, we know that's happening in the United States and household size is increasing there. More people are living together. And of course, a lot of it is not particularly chosen. It's, you know, young adults moving back in with their parents because, you know, they can't live anywhere else. So what we want to do is to try and do this in a proactive, planned way. But certainly local currencies will be part of the mix of that middle uh, between the, if you like, completely non-monetary and the formal currency. What we don't know will happen in the main economy is there may be a period where deflation means that dollars are actually really valuable in the sense they're scarce, but they can buy a lot, like in the Depression, where prices of most things go down, uh, whereas that 
could restabilise in the future or it could lead eventually to the hyperinflationary situation where you get the Weimar uh, sort of barrow of, of notes where money is actually not worth anything. So those dynamics will affect how things like local currencies work. But uh, social media and information technology means that it is technically possible to do accounting systems with local currencies very, very easily compared with when we experimented with it in the late 80s with a really weird computer program on this weird laptop trying to maintain a let system. <laughs> Sorry again for the long answer. Yeah, local currencies have got a, a big future. Um, yes. Uh, you go to places like France and a lot of European countries and you don't actually have the urban sprawl mm. that we see in, in Australia now. We, we see all these new housing developments getting on more and more arable and highly productive land. Yep. Um, do they, their model... Would they use that, um, the, the more um, the sustainable model like you've um, spoken about um, there, or...? Well, their context is, is different in that the, the urban fabric is always being constrained and you don't have um, developers dangling the carrot of huge amounts of money to farmers and then land being rezoned so farmers being forced off. Agriculture is often, you know, protected and that, you know, yes, no, the urban area is only here. So we haven't, we've had a different history. For all my lifetime, the planning profession and environmentalists have used the European less car dependent model as this is what we should be doing. Now, what we've done is build a whole lot of greater density and expand on the fringes and have more house per person than has ever existed in history in any country in the world. And the reason we've done that is that because that's how government policies have driven growth in GDP. We only have two economies in Australia. One is extracting things out of the landscape and especially digging holes in the ground and the other is putting up buildings. So the planning profession and the environment movement basically got conned into supporting this higher density for the sake, the hope, that this would stop this expansion over prime agricultural land and to try and get the greater density supposedly to support public transport. And it was interesting that Peter Newman whose work I respect enormously, uh, West Australian uh, academic, uh, very influential both in his home state and around the world for um, uh, uh, solutions to car dependent cities and greater public transport. When he first saw an early version of Aussie Street, he was horrified that I was effectively giving um, promotion to the urban, uh, suburban sprawl. And he actually said that as a, as a criticism in his book, um, Sustainable Cities, that came out in 2009. Uh, other academics said to me, are you going to challenge back? You know, this said, wait. <laughs> so this is the pushback. And we now have academics like Brendan Gleeson, who's head of Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute, has written two books on Australian urban development, Heartlands, uh, Australian uh, Heartlands about suburbia. His latest book with, with Sam Alexander is um, uh, called Degrowth in Suburbia. And they asked me to write the foreword to it. It's a total academic book, but we are starting to see this, the start of pulling apart this sort of notions that have been going round and round in the same debate. We need to completely reframe these debates. And the property bubble will destroy all those assumptions in any case. So we, you know, it's, it's actually way too late in terms of climate change, peak oil, to say we're going to rebuild our cities on a European model. To do that, we needed to have started to have done that in the 1970s. And fortunately, the template of low-density suburbia is actually ideal 
for this transformation I'm talking about. We are incredibly lucky because that pattern will be the most sustainable residential pattern of the future. More than rural living or high density urban living. Um, to follow on from some of the other questions that have already been asked, uh, so politicians aren't really addressing the underlying issue here that we have this sort of unlimited growth model and Melbourne, for instance, is growing by approximately 100,000 people per year. And their solution to that is either high density living or yep. ploughing over the, uh, the agricultural land. Or now they're talking about regionalising growth. Yep. But all that seems to do is export the problem. So, for instance, you now see sort of satellite towns like Warrigal and even here in the Latrobe yep. Valley. And that acts as a, a pressure release valve for mm. those problems of the city. How do we not simply kick the can down the road by saying, well, we'll just move all that problem that's in Melbourne, in including, for instance, that there are high house prices, but you can get, get cheaper houses in Warwick or the Latrobe Valley. Yeah, so look, what I'm mostly focused on with Retro Suburbia is helping those people who want to act in their own household situation, live a better life now, be more resilient for the challenges that are coming. But there is some potential agency in that to influence or affect what happens. But I think it's very, very small. And ironically, governments are also losing agency because asset bubbles always burst. The history of this stuff is very, very clear. What the kicking the can down the road is like the latest version is, you know, the next um, uh, sucker uh, investment run, the first homeowners, extra incentives, and maybe they can hit, get interest rates to zero. The trouble is when interest rates go to zero, people take taking their money out of the bank because why would you have the money in the bank? The policies the large-scale policy changes are going to completely fail. What needs to be in place is some sort of model of people just doing things and academics recording what that is achieving in terms of whether it's greenhouse gas emissions or social cohesion or um, uh, financial security to model these primarily behavioural changes. Because uh, as I said, we have more buildings than we need. And I'm serious about that, but that claim is unsupported by a whole body of PhDs and whatever. But in making that sort of claim over the last 10 years, trying to get that traction into back to academics and eventually back to the mainstream media to say this false discussion that we're having about these three options, the infill um, development in the suburbs, the high rise in the centre, the expansion, or the fourth one you mentioned, that we just turn Geelong and Morewell and um, uh, Warrigal into these huge expanded towns. No, the growth is That's fake. Look, the real growth that people refer to is population, but buildings, the amount of building being built at, for each person is going up, not just because of the incremental larger houses, it's because no one is actually living in those houses because they're spending all their time at work, at school, in the gymnasium, in the coffee shop, so you've got to build another whole lot of building stock to do what used to once happen in the household and um, community non-monetary economy. So for example, if you start buying your lunch instead of making your lunch at home, there is no increase in the number of lunches. All that's happened is it's been monetarised, which increases GDP. But that requires more infrastructure more stuff to be built. 
And the way we are getting economic growth, apart from the tap of, of immigration being constantly, you know, to drive growth, we're actually sucking all the economic activity out of the household and community non-monetary economies and putting it in the monetary economy and calling it economic growth. So I'm claiming, without any hard evidence, that 50% of the growth in GDP in my lifetime is completely fake. Because all it did is like the lunch. It hasn't actually created more goods and services, it's just moved it and monetarized it. So if it's better for the environment, better for society and better for everyone's financial security, we can move some of that activity back and call it economic growth, which makes me pro-growth. <laughs> you know, like, what, what I'm saying is that all of the old discussions about this stuff have to be just shattered because they are all fake, you know, and yet the demand has to be there to answer that. Like, infill development and this development is a cargo cult. And it's based around the idea that if you put up more buildings, you will have more people that achieves greater urban density and that provides all of the economies that are supposedly associated with greater density. You know, so, and I, I realise I can't in this forum and sort of discuss those things and I don't have a book about that because we chose not to write a book about that instead to say the pathway is by what actually people do at home will change the system and but I am incredibly pleased to have academics of the caliber of Brendan Gleeson starting to support this sort of uh, agenda but the real the real pioneering is what people do in their households and how they reorganise. And we basically know we have to get bigger households because our households are too small to be sustainable. Our houses are too big, but our households, the number of people living together is too few to be sustainable and resilient. Well, what about at the macro level though? Because when I was growing up, Australia had population. What about at the macro level? Because when I was growing up, Australia had a population of about 18 million people. We're predicted to go to about 40 million. Melbourne was about 3 million people, and it's predicted to go to at least 7 million people. Even if per capita consumption goes down, simply by having double the number of people, the, the, the overall consumption will increase. The, what you need to understand that metric, and we don't have it, is firstly how much floor area per person there was, how much time people spent at home and how much extra building stock and infrastructure was built at the same time to support that number of people. And what we find is this escalating increase because we have all these buildings under empty, under lock and key, with everyone rushing between them. And that increases GDP at the same time that it trashes the environment and destroys people's quality of life. So, the, yes, the increase in population is real, but when I mention, what I mentioned about that discretionary economy, and I'm serious about it, the gymnasia, the dog shampoo services, the cafes, what are we going to do with all those buildings when people, when we move back to a sort of a spuds, beer and petrol economy? Because that's what will happen. We move back to the basics and everyone stops spending on things that are not essential. You know, we have vast tracts of uh, commercial and semi-commercial buildings that will have no tenants. What are we going to do with them? Well, we're obviously going to retrofit them. So even if we have continuing population growth, um, and I suspect that will become politically unsustainable um, as, you know, immigrants will get blamed more and more for, you know, for bad times. And then the last thing to think about is when world trade collapses to, say, 50% of what it is now, how many empty shipping containers are going to be sitting on the wharves in Melbourne? Is everyone aware of the whole shipping container architecture? That, you know, um, the tiny house movement of, 
people putting um, tiny houses in backyards, partly because they can't afford to live somewhere, but just occupying, you know, re-inhabiting the landscapes we already inhabit. So I'm not saying that necessarily that these outcomes are going to be all rosy, but they are actually what the future is, rather than these dreams of some ordered, uh, planned uh, change. Uh, David, I'm just interested if you can tie together two things. One is about the uptake of your ideas and the impact of that on the communities that are taking them up. I'm out down the back. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, one of the, the first influences when I first did Aussie Street with Richard Heinberg in Western Australia on the peak oil and permaculture tour, and he was giving the bad news about peak oil, and I was giving the positive news about permaculture with an early version of the Aussie Street story. And uh, Shani Graham and Tim Darby, um, you know, were sort of horrified at the state of things, you know, the evidence and, uh, and combined with, you know, the unfolding climate crisis. And, um, you know, said, what are we going to do? And, and they said, we're going to create Aussie Street where we live. And the Holbert Street uh, project was an amazing outcome. You can see her on Perth TEDx um, take a street and create a community. Uh, their new place, which is just a few streets away from where they used to live, um, is called Ecoburbia. Uh, that's one of the case studies in retro suburbia. But, you know, even more inspiring with that, late in the research of the book, we went to a place called Hibby Farm after Hibiscus Court in West Heidelberg. Um, they're the people on the, the cover of the book. And our son was there as the photographer, and I was a bit hard-bitten, maybe a bit more business-focused than I am. He's been around this scene all his life, and he says, tell me what you want photographed, you know, like, they just this and that. And we went to all these places, and then we went to Hibby Farm, and he got so excited. He said, we've got to come back here and take the cover photo. And that's got to say to my generation, I want that life now. Well, Hibby is a household of two sisters and their husbands and four kids sharing a two-bedroom house in West Heidelberg. But there's a whole network of neighbours that's just called The Hood who share milking the goats and pull down the fences. And it's incredible. Um, and I think as we've gone around doing these events, we keep hearing about people doing this and going, yeah, that's us. So part of that is actually just giving a name and a reality to create a new normal. And one of the things that Shani Graham said is it was really interesting in Hulbert Street that when about 20% of people were involved in the street parties and different stuff, because they mostly did things through just, um, you know, fun activities, um, that the 80% started to act like they themselves were the minority. So it doesn't take much of a critical mass, not necessarily that everyone rushes and adopts that, but that it becomes accepted that this is, this is a new normal. It doesn't require 50%. But what we know from majority politics is that 51% may be enough to change a government, but it doesn't change any fundamental policy in the system. How many people do we need to vote to get society to say move towards sensible degrowth um, policies supporting stuff like this? Would 80% be enough? Probably not. Like when Australia was going to go to the, um, to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, I think it was about 70% of the Australian population were against it, but we still went. So the power is definitely there in, in, in people just making those uh, small changes. And I think um, 
Some of our colleagues are saying also amongst young people the upswelling in interest in self-reliance, repair cafes, all these different ways. There's many people doing this stuff now they've never even heard of permaculture, uh, let alone retro suburbia. But it's just uh, sort of welling up from the bottom. And I think what we can do is help put a name and a connection to a lot of these things, because a lot of these patterns all sort of uh, fit together. And I think that expands out into the very mainstream moves towards you know, zero waste and more radical uh, adoption of minimising impact. But the motivations for people are all quite different. And one of the things I say, especially to people in communities where they despair about, what about all those other people who don't even believe in climate change? So you don't need to believe in climate change to see common sense in Aussie Street. It doesn't depend on that. So the motivations for people can be quite different in, uh, even though most of the ones we know about are the sort of usual, you know, uh, bleeding heart people who worry about the future and are trying to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions or whatever. That's actually not um, essential. And our next sort of strategy, in a sense, is to sort of try and project this stuff out to see the commonalities with people who are on the other side. Um, and this is what colleague Peter Harper in Britain said to me after the Brexit vote. He said, I think we need something like your Aussie Street story as what he called an adapter plug across to people who might appear to be the opposite of those values. Because there's actually a lot of commonality. And one of the threads of that is that sense of constriction about being allowed to do things, whether it's are uh, you allowed by the council to have chooks or that there's a lot of people on that other side of the fence who feel incredibly suffocated. So building a synergy between people who are, if you like, green-minded uh, people may be seen to be on the left and people who are... Uh, the opposite of that, and that includes uh, you know, people who might be described as rural, right-wing, libertarian rednecks, that there's actually a whole lot of synergies, not just in Aussie Street, but in, in retro suburbia as a whole, to connect in that way. Um, I've got up onto uh, too much of a soapbox, haven't I? <laughs> I'd like to know a little bit more about your personal journey in what you've created your own place because there's obviously a lot of skill and communication and networking in being able to, to be able to do what you've done in your own way on your own land. Yeah, well, we, we moved to Hepburn in 1985 um, Sue threw in her job effectively as an Italian interpreter by moving to the country. Um, her two uh, teenage kids uh, were sort of moving school. Uh, I was um, just into starting my micro business as a, a permaculture design consultant. Uh, we chose not to buy a rural property but to buy one hectare of blackberry covered wasteland uh, in a suburban street um, and became owner builders and built with savings uh, without being in debt and over the years increased our self-reliance just step by step um, from already being engaged in that doing a little bit more each year and resisting a lot of the opportunities that came up for, oh, fly over to this conference on the other side of the world. And yet I managed to maintain enough practical work, mostly as a permaculture design consultant, but increasingly through permaculture education and public speaking, um, and the supporting work in the global permaculture movement, which of course, like 
and paid work. And so, so it was one third of time in the household, self-reliance, growing your own food, you know, building stuff, doing stuff yourself. One third in paid work related to permaculture and one third in, in sort of voluntary sort of work. And we managed to do that um, and not earn a taxable income because most of the things we did were actually business expenses, um, including our one hectare property, which is a permaculture demonstration site, which is, I've argued, is the best documented permaculture demonstration site in Australia. We now have three semi-autonomous houses, households on that one hectare as long as, along with 180 fruit and nut trees and dams and whatever. So it's sort of a, an example which relates to small rural properties but it also relates back to the retro suburbia context. And there are a lot of examples in the retro suburbia book that are from our property of Meliodora. But it's not one of the case studies because, for a start, it's a design from scratch, a passive solar house. So we wanted to focus on the how do we retrofit what people have already got. So that drew on what a lot of other colleagues had been doing for years and stuff we've been teaching in permaculture courses uh, for a long time. But you could say, yeah, it's been a lifetime. No, I, I was really impressed with what I saw at your place. Um, the community, you know, the various people. Um, but I think there is a lot of skill in being able to establish a model like that. And I believe that in order to go forward, like you got to organise an event, I personally wouldn't feel capable of doing anything because it's just so big. And you've got to start little baby steps. Yeah. And one thing that really concerns me personally is the amount of rates that we are getting. And I know that, you know, mm. that's... Because I really believe that we should move towards the service, pay for the services that you receive. Mm. And I personally am passionate about that that's what I like it to be, to be my legacy, that to change the system. But in, in that way, and I'd like to leave with that, is if you had, say, you know, 200 acres in, in suburbia, how could we then do a model which would work and which would highlight a whole lot of different ingredients. Well, I think the models have to come at the household and self-organising level. Uh, and also some people who are become household, uh, become neighbourhood landlords, just like developers, you know, buying the house next door and being able to sort of coordinate some sort of changes that occur with tenants and other people. And then at the same time, the constant discussion back with councils, through councillors, through sustainability programs, and that's what we're uh, working on with a, a lot of these presentations, to talk about these issues of how councils, as the front line of government closest to the people who are doing the most progressive work uh, right across the sustainability agenda, even though they have the least resources, uh, to open up those channels of discussion of how councils can facilitate and assist. So for example, the take in a border program to encourage people to take in a border would be very beneficial to a whole lot of issues that local government has to deal with. But at the federal level, this could be seen as economic treason against GDP. <laughs> uh, in terms of rates and services, yes, at Meliodora, we've paid the rates through the years for rubbish collection but we basically don't have any rubbish. We tried to negotiate with the council, can we just have a few um, licences to go to the tip like rural people do, and we'll just take, oh no, you couldn't do that. Um, you know, so some of these things take a longer time, and we do have to accept that the pioneers, the innovators, will be working against a whole lot of things that are drag us down, but there's a huge number of advantages in being the early adopter. You know, when you go to the rubbish tip and get the free choice of all the materials that the property bubble growth is throwing away, just imagine in a contracting economy, you know, maybe there won't be so much choice. Um, you know, so that there's advantages and disadvantages of being pioneers in this, but I think a lot of the steps are small, 
um, behavioural changes that are actually turn out to be very radical. Uh, you know, just a few home parents sharing childcare instead of deciding to cart their kids off to school and the kids, uh, you know, to childcare and the kids experiencing um, more of a self-organised, you know, re-inhabiting, colonising the street again. <laughs> you know, all of those basic things that were there just when we were young, surely we can easily recreate some of those and that those things are some of the stepping stones into deepening it. As our uh, colleague Kat Lavers said, who you know, on her small property in Northcote is now producing close to a half a tonne of food uh, two days a week maximum she puts into it and, and she does this professionally helping, you know, train people in home gardening through uh, Hobson's Bay Council Sustainability Program, she says, just we need to get a little bit better at doing what we're doing and just keep improving. Uh, because yes, the skill base, as you say, is really important and we can't grow a new generation of garden farmers like overnight, because you can't fast track the growing seasons, you know. <laughs> so it, it is through doing, but it, if you look at that, starting with kids that are just as babies out in the garden, osmotically absorbing those things, peers like we're doing nothing, that's laying the foundations for, for these sorts of change. At the same time that we need a bit, the larger vision of what's possible, and so just um, for a reference, uh, I wrote an essay called Feeding Retro Suburbia from the Backyard to the Bioregion, which is that big vision picture of what a bioregional food system would look like that home gardeners are part of. Um, because, yeah, sometimes we can get overwhelmed by, I'm doing this little thing here, but how does it, how does it all fit in? What, what else needs uh, to happen. To give people that um, optimism that it is possible and that what they're doing is actually a significant part in the puzzle. Thank you. Unfortunately, we've, uh, we've run out of time. Um, thank you, David, for an extremely thought-provoking presentation. Uh, my guess is we could keep you talking for days on this topic. <laughs> Please join me in thanking David again for a fantastic talk. <laughs>